Hello, everyone, and welcome to Anything But Ordinary. Tonight's topic is a viewer's request, Haunted Oklahoma. I am your host, Spooky, and here's your other host, the most awesome Raven. Hey. Hey. I'm glad we're on tonight. You know, still getting adjusted to us doing it every two weeks, but we do miss doing this weekly, and hopefully... We'll but we'll get to back to that soon. Sometime, yeah. But um, tonight's was a viewer request the show yeah so, uh, i thought we lost you because you have that snow or you have that rain tornado weather I, going we're, on, so I hope yeah we you. uh probably should tell the listeners that if i suddenly get thrown off we're we're under a tornado watch and we're having some pretty bad weather here so let's just cross oh, our God, fingers and yeah. pray that i stay for the whole show yeah but um we just, thank you to the viewer you know they messaged us after the last one and um we are planning on hitting everybody else's viewer requests. It's just we have them all written down and getting them when we can and stuff. But um, while I was doing my research for t um, tonight, I did notice something I thought was interesting. I don't know if this is the exact amount, but there was almost 2,000 places on the National Registry of Historic Places in Oklahoma, which I think is, like, super cool because I love – history and old buildings and things like that you know and oh i do too i just I, I you know i i'm more in for the history really any more than the paranormal but i found that very impressive over two thousand uh, what almost, almost two thousand places yeah according to a few websites and stuff but you know it's like there's so many towns in oklahoma have these such beautiful old buildings and it's just like you're stepping back in time. And they all had a lot of interesting stories behind them. You know, not oh, just yeah. about the paranormal, but it's cool to learn the history because you kind of understand why the place may have residual or, you know, intelligent haunting things going on, you know. And, you know, when I was kind of looking around and, you know, what do I want to pick for the show? And, you know, I was just seeing all these old buildings, you know, and just kind of reading about the history and different places that were happening in different towns and stuff. It does bring up in your mind the dust bowl, you know, the dust storm that happened back in the 1930s and the things oh, yeah. that all those people went through, you know? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, the dust bowl lasted for over a decade and people lost family and livestock, not to mention their homes. And many of them were just forced to, to flee. Yeah. I mean... We should do a show on that too, <laughs> too. You know. Yeah, we should. You recall when we talked about picture Oklahoma in a previous show on abandoned ghost towns in the USA? Oh yeah, that's when they had that place that was all like lead contamination. It was like a super fund, fund, not yeah. like super fun F U N, but F U N D site, where like basically all these people were like forced out of their homes because of some stupid man-made disaster, which was basically. The government dropped the ball on that because they were supposed to um, pay this funding to go in and clean it all up, and they didn't. They just kind of left it. I know, and to this day, that place is still toxic. I know, and I think there's I think there's one guy living there that uh, he's kind of the caretaker of the town. I think he's you know to keep trespassers and people out. Yeah, well, some people. I mean, some people got paid, but we really got enough money to even relocate but i you know right that's a you guys go check out that show we have but i really liked um searching for tonight's picks anyway because i came across like i said so many things about oklahoma which i found really interesting you know everywhere from like reading about how it became the 46th state to like a ton of things like i found that you know people have like and it's kind of interesting because when we're looking into the paranormal, of course, you're going to come across those who like have the UFO encounters. And then you also mm -hmm. have all these people who are running into these bipedal creatures. And it seems like every state, there's like a ton of things that are going on, you know. So that's why yeah. you really have to get to doing those um, cryptid states. <laughs> you keep reading <laughs> that's true. so many we of them. I know. We should really do something about that, uh, a show on that. But I was just amazed because Oklahoma is a plethora of paranormal activity. And, there's, you know, there's a lot of things going on there that I would have never, never, ever thought. And some of the people that went through the state, you know, or settled in the state, whatever, you know, uh, a lot of famous outlaws hid out there and, and just all kinds of things. It was just fascinating just reading about it. Yeah. 
a lot of people don't think of like Oklahoma too much, you know, for whatever reason, for paranormal stuff or whatever, but there is a lot that seems to go on. And the fact that they kept a lot of their old buildings and trying to keep them and they're on these national registries and stuff, I think that's really cool. But, you know, um, a lot of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, tonight's topic is one of our um, reoccurring themes that we have where we're trying to cover like all the states in the U.S. for haunted location. And of course, Oklahoma is just going to be another one of those states we end up doing a few times because there was just so many places that you and I both came across with um, oh, paranormal activity. And we only tried to do a two-hour show, so me and you both try to fit four or five in each. That's two. Well, you know, one of the things that happened in Oklahoma, too, was that great land rush mm, where, yeah. um, where they, when they finally opened up Oklahoma to settlers. Right, and I'm going to kind of talk about that, that with one of the picks i picked tonight too but yeah yeah i have i i mentioned it in one of mine also and uh but what we will be doing is talking a little bit on the history of each location as well as the supposed reports of paranormal encounters for you guys mm -hmm. um why don't you go ahead and start us off for tonight okay thank you i think i will my first pick is the Henry Overholzer Mansion, and it's located at 405 Northwest 15th Street in Oklahoma City. Now, this is an 11,700 square foot, 20 room, three story Victorian mansion built in 1903 at the cost of $38,000, which was quite a sum back then. Uh, it was designed by W.S. Matthews, who was a London-trained architect for, Hen uh, um, for Henry uh, Overholzer and his wife, Anna. Uh, this brick and sandstone mansion is considered the first mansion in Oklahoma City. Now, it also, there is also a 4,000-square-foot carriage house out back, which is quite large for a carriage house. And the inside contains the original furniture, the light fixtures, which were imported from Italy, uh, stained glass windows from France, carpets from England, and woodwork from Belgium. And on the walls are very, very ornate canvas paintings, which is a tribute uh, to the 89ers. And the 89ers were the people who arrived after the Great Land Run in 1889. They were the ones that came in and really started businesses and stuff. I think they were the more wealthy people. Uh, one thing I found interesting is that the mansion was not built in Oklahoma City exactly, but it's built a mile outside of it. Uh, still, though, it remained the center of the social elite, and anyone who was anyone vied for inv invitations to be seen at this place. Now, Henry was born April 14, 1846, in Ohio, and he was one of 13 children born to John and Elizabeth Overholzer. Uh, he married Emma Hannah in June of 1869, and during this marriage, they had a son named Edward and a daughter they named Elizabeth. Now, Henry worked in the mercantile business for about 13 years, and during this time, he invested in property uh, in Colorado and Wisconsin where he started a variety of real estate and building ventures. This man was very astute when it came to business. Um, for reasons that I could not find, um, Henry and Emma divorced in 1880 and he stayed single and um, actually he uh, basically raised his two children and in own? 18... So she yeah. basically left or... I don't know what the deal was. I couldn't find anything on that divorce. Hmm. Well, if Nothing. anybody knows, I... go ahead and send us a link because we're always interested to learn more, you know. Yeah, really. Uh, and I really looked for that because I couldn't figure out why he, you know, was raising the, the, the children. Uh, now, in 1889, he moved to the Oklahoma Territory. And there he met and he married Anna Ione Murphy in October of that year. So he didn't waste any time on that one. Um, now, when he first arrived, he began uh, to he he just started buying up property and built and building businesses. But wasn't with, with his oh, own what, money? Right. Hold on a second, because you said he got uh, remarried. I'm trying to. You're kind of talking really fast, so I'm trying to catch up what you're trying to say. 
He but, remarried in 1889. Right, in October. But um, it's kind of it was normal back then for a man to go find another wife who has children so that they had a mother figure back then. So it wasn't all that uncommon for people to a man to get remarried very quickly back well, in that's the 1800s. True. So that it was But he stayed he stayed single for 9 years, you know. I mean, I'm pretty sure his kids were probably you know, pretty well grown by the time he moved to Oklahoma. Because oh, okay. it didn't say anything about his first children going to the Oklahoma territory with him. Okay, I missed that part because you were talking really fast, so I was trying oh, to I'm catch sorry. up on you. I was trying to pay attention, but I had to ask because I was losing. So. Um, I'm sorry. Sometimes I do that. I'm it's okay. Just sorry. <laughs> we're live. We okay, get nervous um, sometimes. It's all good. Uh, but like I said, you know, he when he got there, he it almost immediately started to buy up property and started building businesses and he did all of this with his own money mm -hmm. now he built the first two-story buildings there and basically this man built Oklahoma City he is considered the father of Oklahoma City uh, he ran for mayor twice but he lost both times but he did manage to become the county commissioner and also in 1903 is when uh, he built the Overholzer uh, Opera House, which still stands on Grand Avenue, and the Overholzer Theater. Now, in 1906, just before Oklahoma gained statehood, he helped the Chamber of Commerce buy land for the Oklahoma State Fair, which the Oklahoma State Fair is still held on that land to this day. Cool. And he, and he also served as... Uh, he served on the on the fair board for many years. Now, in 1905, Henry and Anna had a daughter, and this was their only child, and they named her, are you ready for this? This is a girl. They mm -hmm. named her Henry Ione Overholzer. What? Henry? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they named their daughter Henry. Oh, I would uh, think like Henrietta or... No, it was Henry. I, that's what I thought at first. I said, that has to be a misprint, you know, which is quite a name for a female child, even back then. Now, I'm, I will refer to her as Ione, though. Uh, Ione would eventually inherit everything. Uh, I have no idea why his other two children did not inherit anything, and there is really not a lot about them. Maybe they passed um, on early... Or they married and just moved on their own way. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to say. Uh, anyway, uh, they uh, they built their mansion, and for years it was the center of social events, weddings, dinners, literary events. You name it, it most likely took place in this in this mansion. And it's like I mentioned before, anyone who was anyone in Oklahoma City, they practically fought for invitations to this place. I would too. I would if I was around um, that time. I'd be like, "Hey, can I wash your windows or anything just to come inside?" Because this place is gorgeous looking. Yes, you know? it is. It is gorgeous, and the links that we post, you'll you'll see this. Um. Uh. Anyway, Iona, 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 grew up and married David Perry, who happened to be the mayor of Oklahoma City at the time. Now. David and Iona never had any children, and when Henry died in 1915, Anna lived in the mansion with her daughter and son-in-law, and it still continued to be the center of the socialite community until her death in 1940. Mm -hmm. Now, Iona and David continued to live in the mansion until Iona's death in 1959. Now, since they had no children, David Perry became the sole heir, and the mansion fell into his hands. Now, David knew and appreciated the value of this mansion as far as its history. And this place is steeped in history. So he wanted to do something to preserve it, because by this time it was starting, you know, to need repairs and stuff. It hadn't fall, fallen into great repair, but it, it was getting there. So, uh, in June of 1970, it became listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and in 1972, David Perry sold it and all of its contents to the Oklahoma Historical Society, 
who came up with the funds to preserve it and now the place is a museum and we will post the link to their website they run tours through this place and their website can give you all the details but uh, like I said this guy he he knew the historic value of this place did they did you happen to know how many rooms were in this place? it's 20 rooms 20, 20 rooms, rooms. Wow. 20 rooms I would like that room way up and, at the and top. And actually, it's referred to as a as a Victorian mansion, but actually, it has several different styles to it. Mm-hmm. You know, I so would love to go through this place. It just looks so beautiful. It yeah. does. It really does. Now, the hauntings that happen there. Uh, visitors have reported that their hair has been played with, uh, unseen hands touching them. There is the apparition of a woman that is believed to be Anna, and she has been seen coming down this grand, the grand staircase and in the music room. Anna did spend a lot of time in the music room. That's where she entertained other ladies. <clears throat> uh, doors closing and opening. Uh, the staff has reported being touched. Uh, they have reported apparitions, disembodied voices, and music when you know there's no radio or nothing because they don't have radios and stuff right. like that in right. this place this place is when you walk into it it's the same way it was when it was built except over the years they did you know modernize it some you know along with the times but this place is stepping back in time when you walk in there yeah uh you have the usual cold spots uh there is the partial apparition of a man who is that's believed to be Henry uh, for some reason this has only been a partial apparition and I think they said it was something like from the waist up uh, but all this but the spirits in this place have are reported as being friendly and the house also appears to be very active that they, they said that no matter what time the day or night especially during the day when the staff is there something happens something moves a door shuts mm -hmm. uh, one woman reported that she was the only one in there they had closed up and she was you know looking over last little minute details before she walked out and locked the place and and doors would just start closing or opening on their own so the, so uh, from what I read the place is very very active yeah, it sounds like from what you were saying, it's got both residual type of maybe and intelligent because <coughs> now I'm going to start coughing right. because we're doing it live, but <coughs> interactive with them and stuff. But I could see why if the whole town loved this place and jumped at any chance during the 1800s to be invited in, I could only imagine why, you know, and I suppose... In the spiritual realm, they wanted to continue to check out this place that they loved so much. Well, they said that Anna was quite the social light and said that she was a very, very gracious hostess. And now the mansion does sit in a subdivision mm. because, you know, of course, they build up around well, it. It's but it's um, life, you know, people. Yeah, keep yeah that's so. true. But at least they but didn't tear it down. That's the best thing. You know what I mean? That's true. They didn't tear it down. I mean, this is a gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous place. I would love to have this place or at least go in there and, you know, spend a day in it. But um, I'm glad you don't uh, own it because you'd be like, you you need to go dust this room now. <laughs> be pretty but, to uh, much. Anna and Henry and their daughter, you know, apparently all three of them just love this place because their daughter and, and son-in-law live there too. Has, when you were doing your research for this and you're reading about uh, people's encounters and stuff, do they allow, is this like a museum now? Or do they allow people to come in and do paranormal investigations? Or now, the I place? did not, you did I did not find one thing about a paranormal investigation taking place in this place. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Not one thing. Although the staff is not really shy about talking about the paranormal activity. Um, it's a museum, you know, it's open, I think, daily. And like I said, one of the links is to their website and you can, you know, get what information you need off of that website. Yeah. So maybe, you know, I, I guess if someone's interested, they could always at least contact the uh, Oklahoma Historical Society who run the museum and yeah. always just ask, you know, do you, you allow 
uh, paranormal groups to come in and maybe for a certain donation price just to keep the upkeep of it or whatever but right well all the my understanding is too that all money that you know because there is a fee to go in there mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a big one but all the money collected goes into the upkeep of this place so you know, and I don't have a problem with going to a place like that, you know, and donating oh, money if it goes yeah. to the upkeep of that place. Because I am all for preserving old buildings, historic, old history. historic buildings. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And Oklahoma you know, seems because, to be keeping a lot of them, a lot of them as I much know. as it can, anyway. There's a lot I was of really impressed. Too. I was really impressed reading about, you know, I mean, it was hard to pick which... Topics which one to I was do gonna... for tonight? Yeah, exactly. Me too. Me too. And, and, but I was impressed at how much. Oklahoma works to preserve their history and their old buildings and, and things like that. It was just well, but they also have a lot because not every place does that. A lot of places do that, but it just seems like Oklahoma is just all for preservation. Well, as much as they can. I mean, there are a lot of ghost yeah. towns that I came across too, but that's in any state as well. You know what I mean? Right. But right. I would still even like to go explore some of those abandoned ghost towns that they have too, because I can only imagine. Oh, I would too. The things that occur there. There are several um, <clears throat> abandoned towns there that were, you know, like abandoned for one reason or another. Well, yeah. But um, I would, I would even like to go to those. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to just, I'd, I'd like to just go through Oklahoma and just stop. You know, where, what, wherever catches my attention, because it just, from what I was reading, just about anywhere you stop, there is either a story of the paranormal. Or they're preserving their old buildings, or there's all sorts of history there and and stuff, and it just, it was just amazing to me, and I just love history. Well, also, but if you think about some of the things that Oklahoma had gone through and the energy that comes from right. those events, just like the Dust Bowl alone, imagine the energy and the, and the dust that occurred during that, and the emotional imprints <laughs> that could have been left on the certain well, areas and stuff just from that, because you know people talk about how that can create like residual type of stuff. So I can right. see why a lot of places can be active. And like one of the places I picked tonight is from Guthrie. And it seems like Guthrie has like a ton of places that seem to be oh, active. Oh yeah. I think just about the entire town of Guthrie is haunted. Yes. Oh, hold on. I got my so picture. why don't you? Out. I know, I gotta find the picture. I got them out of, or out of order. <laughs> I'm fired. Okay, I found it. Okay, um, I picked Logan County Hospital. Now, this is located on West Warner Street in Guthrie. Now, from what I read on the net, this building has had, you know, several different owners and had several different hospital names through, you know, through the years. But back in 1925, there was the Methodist Episcopal Conference who funded the proj project to actually build this new hospital to be built in Guthrie because the old Methodist hospital, which was already built in like 19, um, 1906, could only hold or kind of like accommodate, you know, 40 patients at that time. So it was kind of too small for the growing town and, of course, the community in the area that was, you know, people were coming and, you know, moving in and stuff. So it couldn't keep up with, you know, people. But... During the construction, you know, funds begin to kind of decrease, you know, because a lot of them were these hospitals and things back then, you know, came from private donations. And because you had the Great Depression kind of going on during this time, the hospital project wasn't able to complete the entire construction design. I think what they ended up doing is like they had all the like beams and structure like that type of stuff but they didn't have they didn't like have all the walls up to encase it in quite yet because they kind of just kind of ran on money so it sat there for a while without any more construction being done to it until i think what i read was in 1931 when the trustees of oklahoma uh, Meth a methodist episcopal hospital and a few uh nursing schools what they ended up doing was i think they put it up for sale and I think from what I was reading, they said like 14 years passed before it was ended up being purchased in 1946 or maybe it was like 1948 by the Order wow. of the Sisters of Benedict. And what they ended up doing is, um, well, of course, they converted the name over to um, Benedictine Hospital or something like that. 
And then the construction began again on the hospital. And it was actually finally completed and ready for use in 1948. So you had, a, you know, from 1925 to, you know, 1948, there was a big chunk of time where, you know, the building was sitting there half finished. But this five-story, 55,000, and I've got all this information from that, so if I'm just off by a hair, I apologize. But um, this is a five-story. It has um, 55,000 square foot building. It had 50 private patient rooms um, where it could hold up to anywhere between two to um, four you know, beds of room. Um, on the ground level is where they had like the emergency room, they had their lab, they had the pharmacy, you know, and then uh, along with the administrative offices, they also had the like the hospital cafeteria. This was all on the ground level. Now on the second floor, they kind of used that just for like the patient stay. And then the third floor, I think, was used for, like, the delivery ward, you know, for in the nursery, you know, for the mothers and the babies and stuff. And then, then the fourth floor, they used for, like, surgeries, x-rays, you know, orthopedic, um, urology, cardiac specialists, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then the top floor was basically where you'd find, like, the chapel and, you know, rooms for the residents, the people who worked there. And then they also had an additional area that was added on later on for like the special needs where they had, you know, over 30 to 40, uh, 40 children being taken care of there on the new app. Um, special needs, was that like newborns or? No, like people who may have had disabilities or. Right. Well, that was, that was. Things like that. The next thing out of my mouth was uh, disabilities and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Or orphans or things like that, you know, it kind okay. of. Okay. Or, you know, it had a little mixture of everything from what I was understanding, but it had like 40 some children being taken care of in that little special section for them. And I guess, you know, 16 years passed and then we get into like 1960s and then, you know, the sisters, they couldn't really uh, afford the growing cost of the hospital and kind of keeping it updated and all that thing. And that's when um, St. Anthony's Hospital, um, they came, um, they well, basically, they owned and operated, like, the Sisters of St. Francis of Maryville or something like that, Missouri or something. Well, and what they ended up buying the hospital in 1964, and they changed the names again to, uh, what is it, Elvero, Elvero Heights or something. And yeah. then another 13 years went by before Guthrie started talking about building another hospital. So, um... In 1974, the hospital's name changed over to the Logan County Memorial Hospital. And then three years later, the hospital was basically deeded to the um, county. And they kind of closed the doors for good, you know, in 1978. And uh, because they basically built a new hospital facility, you know, west yeah. side of Guthrie or whatever. That's usually the way it goes, yeah. Well, right, because it's kind of hard to keep updating and keeping up with the demands of a growing population with an old building, you always have to expand oh, exactly. more, and it takes a lot to tear down things, put in new wiring and all that, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the hospital facility, you know, it remained boarded up for about four years until like 1982 when the, um, I think there was named R and T properties. They kind of purchased this building and I think, and the, you know, all the four acres or whatever it was, it sat on. And I, um, from the Logan County Hospital Trust authorities, whatever they, they, what they want to do is they wanted to remodel this old place into apartment complex, which a lot of people tend to do with older buildings. But yes, they do. According to several sites, um, they never ended up doing it. Now I'm not sure if they still own this place or not because I was reading on other sites that the Logan County might still ha uh, might have the ownership of it again. I'm not sure. Now the reason why I picked this place is you and I, you know, well, many years ago, I was searching on the net, you know, looking for, you know, live paranormal cams, you know, and I stumbled across the OKC PRG, uh, PPRG group, uh, basically the, mm -hmm. the Oklahoma City Ghost Club. And what, right. they had set up several cameras and audio throughout this hospital for a research project. Now, the website cams are have been kind of down for a few years or uh, maybe the website changed because I can't find it anymore, you know, because me and you used to watch it for like ever. I know. I can't find that place anymore either. We we used to 
spend hours just watching yeah we'd be on skype watching together and talking but for 10 years you know they had those cams going and both you and i spent many a night watching those cams and we have seen things we had heard things while we were Mm -hmm. watching them you know we both spoke about this place on other shows that we've done on you know previous shows but we always seem to go back to this place like remember when we seen this on this cam or whatever and um you know, and when it was always pertaining to the paranormal, because this place was just always active every time we watched it. It didn't matter if it was daytime, nighttime. We would always catch something on one of the cameras, you know. And both you and I, we saw shadow entities walking down the hallways, going into different rooms. We saw uh-huh. um, balls of light, you know, uh, not just like, oh, dust orbs or whatever. We're talking about things that emitted their own light and would co- go through the wall. Right or go through another wall or they would have like their own it's almost like they had their own thought because they they would go down the hallway stop turn go into a room like they knew what it had like thought to it it was so weird watching these things and then we also used to hear like old time music or we would catch like faint conversations being heard you know um, and both you and I had screen capped tons of stuff from this these cams. Remember that one night we were watching it and the cam was showing there was this one place where they had a piano sitting there and we heard that piano music that night? Yeah, and we used to see like a little boy. Remember like this little boy? Mm-hmm. But I would have showed some of the screen caps, but like we said before in our previous shows, whenever we always talk about this place, I, you know, I lost my old hard drive, so I lost all of that. So it kind of sucks. But... Um, the OKC PRG group, you know, they would also have investigations in this place and we could watch them live doing their investigations and they captured EVPs and other stuff when they were in there. But people talk about seeing apparitions staring out the windows of the hospital, you know, on several different floors, they would see it. They would see shadow entities while they were in this place or on the ground. You know, people talked about capturing a female uh, apparition in a photo on the third floor, but which we've seen would look like, uh, cause you didn't always see like a, you, there'd be some missing body part, but you would see these apparitions appear and go down the hallway. Some of them looked like they were patients. Other times it would look like they'd been a nurse or a doctor. And I remember that one time when we saw this thing crawling on the floor when we were watching. Oh yeah. One of I the creepy that. cams of that place was the morgue. Cause the morgue had like this weird, thing in it or there was the children's room too remember when they had yeah the children's uh thing um that was just i i miss watching those cams and if they ever tune in and hear this you know everybody would you know yeah. i would if donate you're listening, to that. start those cams again yeah i would donate money just to see and watch again but you know people talk about um hearing things when they're in there being touched they talk about having lights flickered on and off you know, being touched or having their hair tugged. Um, I think one of my favorites when we watch this, because Rocky, remember Rocky the raccoon who ran around oh, yeah. and lived in that place? There was one time me and Spooky were watching, and we're like, our eyeballs are like up on the screen because we were seeing something. and Or no, we were hearing something. We're like, what is that noise? Because we kept hearing like something strange through the audio coming on, and we were on Skype, and so we're glued to the screen, like really looking close, like, trying to see where this uh, noise could have come from if maybe if apparition was going to show up or whatever and all of a sudden this white stuff just falls down to the ground and this thoop, this object falls <laughs> and the raccoon was running i guess on the <coughs> ceiling tiles and he hit a weak spot i guess and it came he came crashing he just fell right through yeah he, he fell right down to the um, floor and he's like Holy richard God. just said yeah richard just sent a message saying the owner of the hospital wanted the camps taken down that's why they aren't up anymore Oh, probably because it was bringing too many people to the place to wanting to sneak in, maybe, or whatever. Yeah, I would imagine that would have been a big problem there. Mm. Yeah, well, because it, it's extremely active, but it's not the only active place in Guthrie. But right. I just remember that night when Rocky fell through the uh, ceiling above and crashed onto the floor and took off running. Man, that scared the crud out of both of us because you were like, holy bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> You know, and then we ended up laughing. <laughs> we, we screamed like cheerleaders and then started laughing when we Cost realized what it flying. was. Yeah, but <laughs> man, I miss watching that the, those cameras. But, you know, don't go to this place. The property is monitored constantly. The cameras aren't taken down because the owner does use cameras. He has the place monitored constantly by the local police and they have their own security system. 
so there are alarms that would trigger and people would know that you're on the property. Even if you're outside, you know, the cops still come around and they're like, hey, what are you doing? And you could possibly be arrested. But um, I did read somewhere that they were trying at one point to actually get this on uh, National Registry. But I'm not sure if they ever did or not. But I, knew, I do know they're... Um, that this hospital is extremely active, not just because of what people are saying who have been there, but just from me and you and Richard, we've all watched and been on Skype together watching these cameras for years. It wasn't just like, oh, a couple of months. We watched for years we and years and years. years. Yeah. And, years. and I'm really bummed out that that hard drive crashed because we had screen caps of shadow entities and other things that were, uh, that we were always, because we were, you know, I've never seen any cameras like this ever this active ever like this place was it was just amazing and, and hopefully we always they'll be something. able to um fix this place up hopefully they don't tear it down i'm hoping somebody turns it into apartment or whatever but um just the history behind it because you know hospitals there's people born in it, there's people who die in it there's people who have emotional issues that are going on so it really leaves an imprint for both leaving residual or intelligent type of activity that could occur you know and i just want to thank um the Sadie's World who allowed us to use this photo. She, I posted her link on the photo, but I also post it in our references later on. She actually has um, a video of it on YouTube where she's flying her drone, so you really get to see a good um, visual of this place. It's just amazing. So after uh, the show tonight, you guys should go and check out Sadie's World on YouTube, and she's got a great drone footage of the Logan County Hospital. I still here. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was looking at the picture. Um, I don't knowing this place. You know, us watching the cam for years, years like yeah, we did like five, six years. I I'm don't. Sorry. I would be really, really skeptical about moving into any apartment that was built in this place. And well, if you place, want to live in a place, haunted or active place, this would be a <clears throat> place to go to. Excuse me. Well, that's true, you know, and if I didn't know about this place and I moved into, you know, if they, I moved into one of the apartments, you can bet that apartment's going to have some activity in it because there was activity all over this place. Oh, man. I we never that watched that. We never watched those cams in all the years that we watched those. Not one time was was there a night that we didn't see, see something. At least something. Even if it wasn't really huge, we did see something. I remember I'd be working and you'd be texting me on the phone during the day like, oh, you got to hop on. I'm like, I'm at work. I can't watch. Screen cap it. Yeah, I know. I saw that daytime. little girl walking down that one hallway. A little girl. Yeah. I I don't know. She looked like maybe she was 18, uh, 18, eight years old, you know, and she had long pigtails. And she just walked right on down the hallway and then just suddenly just poof, was gone. Yeah, it was just interesting to see things going into and out of rooms. But I remember that one time that there was this thing that was kind of creepy when it was crawling along the floor. And it just, mm -hmm. that freaked me out kind of watching. But the morgue was always really, the, that the, that cam always kind of gave me the creeps. It always felt like there was something uh, sinister there or something. But I don't know. I really wanted to talk about this place just because of what we had witnessed, you know. Plus, there was other people who had seen things, you know what I mean? Right. Well. It was, I miss those cams. I really miss them. Oh, Richard sent a link saying that, in the newspaper in 2017 they're talking about the hospital to be converted into senior living center oh lovely but i don't think it's cleaned up yet though richard i mean not from what it looked on some of the pictures that sadie had or whatever but you know but that's good at least they're not tearing it down so if they're going to well, recycle good. and use the building i love that well i know, know for years they kept the location a secret because they didn't want a lot of people going there you know, and trespassing on the property and oh, stuff. Oh, the camp, so. yes, that paranormal group, um, what did we, what did I say it was OK, OKCPRG, the Oklahoma City Ghost Club, they were very yeah. respectful in their investigating, you know, because we got to watch them live mm -hmm. while they were doing it when they were in the hospital, uh, and the way that they maintained their website and their forms and stuff was so professional. This is a, like, they were an amazing group. I don't even know if they're still, uh, 
um, doing this stuff, but you guys can check out Oklahoma City Ghost Club and see if they're still around. But I know this wasn't their only research project. They had had other ones right. too, but this is one that we had watched for years. We probably watched it. I haven't six, even seen their years, website for a long time. Yeah, but no, they were highly professional, and they kept the name of the because we didn't know the name of the hospital for a while. But when I started researching for what we were going to do for tonight and I stumbled on this and I'm like, Oh, that is the place. You know what I mean? Right. But everybody in Guthrie, you know, practically knows this place has activity, but I mean, this isn't the only place in Guthrie. It seems like Guthrie is probably it, just one about of the, the top entire places. town of Guthrie has paranormal activity. Yeah. There's a lot going on. So it makes you want to research more the history of the area and what, you know, what's under the ground, what kind of, Right stuff they had going on or whatever, but Guthrie is from a lot of places that were. And we tried not to do like everything in Guthrie, you know, try to jump around a little bit in <laughs> really? different places in Oklahoma. But Guthrie seems to. We have could a probably lot do an on. entire show on Guthrie, Oklahoma. Yeah, we could do a whole bunch of shows on Oklahoma just from the histories and other stuff that has occurred there. But yeah, do you want to go ahead and go into your next one or? Okay. The Skirvin Hilton Hotel, which is at One Park Avenue in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Another Oklahoma City one. The hotel was built in like 1910 and it opened for business in 1911. Now, it was built by oil millionaire W.B. Skirvin, who was an original 89er. Uh, he built it because he wanted to have the most luxurious hotel and the finest hotel in the Southwest. And he did. Uh, this It had two 10-story towers that contained 224 rooms, and it was the first business in Oklahoma City to have air conditioning. Back then, though, it was called ice air because it was running, because it they had a way of running ice water through the rooms, into each room, which cooled it down. So what, did um, they have, like, a system where they'd put a bunch of blocks of ice and then the air would blow over it and then it would go throughout the ventilation system? No, I had running ice water. It was like in, um, I want to say trough-like things that it just, it ran through the rooms. I'm not sure well, what, that's very how inventive. it worked. But I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was. I thought it was. Um, it had a ballroom that seated 500 people and it had chandeliers from Austria that cost $100,000 each. And it had this fabulous two-story lobby. Not many places had a two-story lobby. So this place, I mean, he went all out on this place. And it was a place where the wealthy and the elite visited often. 200000 for two chandeliers. That'd be like, oh, it's, it's like he's tossing out a, a buck. Oh, this is nothing. I could. No, that was like three or four chandeliers there. Dang, dude. I know. This guy, he was an oil millionaire. You know, back today, he would have been considered a billionaire. Mm -hmm. um, the place became so popular that in the 1930s, they built another tower and they extended the floors from 10 floors to 14 floors, you know, with the new addition. And then, you know, uh, uh, it contained over 500 rooms. Now, one of the reasons that the place became so popular is because of Skirvin's daughter, daughters uh one was socialite pearl mesta mm -hmm. and one of his daughters was a silent film star uh her name was marguerite skirvin now do you know uh, any of the films but, by chance that she did or? i don't know any of the films i went to look them up but things just kept you coming distracted. up on pearl yeah uh Pearl, in 1916, Pearl married millionaire George Mesta and was widowed in 1925. And she was the only heir to his $78 million fortune. Oh. This was in 1925. She hit the jackpot. Now, she really did hit the jackpot. Now, I could go into her long history um, because this is another one. We could, do, we could do at least a half a show on this woman alone. Um, but um, under Harry S. Truman, she, uh, Pearl became the ambassador to Luxembourg, and then later she was a Washington, D.C. hostess. Now, this woman had political connections that a lot of politicians dream about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, everyone wanted to know her and be seen with her. 
Uh, she was big in the women's movement and, you know, a lot of other things. Um, but, uh, so of course, you know, when she moved back to Oklahoma City, she brought her connections and social status with her. Now, during Prohibition, the hotel became a very popular speakeasy. Now, it was during this time that W.B. Skirvin, his actual name was William Balzer, did you Skirvin. say speakeasy? This place became a speakeasy? Yeah, the place was a speakeasy. Nice. Um, but, um, and during that time, now that was during Prohibition, and during that time, uh, William Skirvin, he had an affair with one of the hotel maids. Now, the maid's name has been lost over time, and so the staff began calling her Effie. Okay. Now, the story is that Effie and William had an affair, and Effie became pregnant. Now, William did not want this known, and uh, this was another guy, by the way, who his wife uh, died, so he raised his children, and he never remarried. Um, but anyway... <clears throat> Uh, Effie became pregnant and William didn't want this known and he didn't want his reputation to be ruined not to mention his family finding out so Effie was confined to a room on the top floor oh. now even after she gave birth to her daughter she was forbidden to leave the room oh. and her depression and isolation finally drove her mad and one day with her baby in her arms she jumped from the window to the street killing them both oh my gosh now, the thing is, you would think that something like this would be front page news, but there was nothing in the papers or anywhere else about this. Now, this is because... He had a lot of money because, he, he could hush people up, basically. Right. Well, one of the things is, you know, maybe the story cannot be confirmed. Okay. Or maybe it didn't happen, but you have to remember the family, and I'm not convinced that the family did not know anything about Effie. Mm -hmm. I believe they had to have known because this is what it would, this is what it would have taken to cover up the suicide. You know, William was a millionaire with local connections. Mm -hmm. He had an actress daughter with Hollywood connections. He had a socialite daughter with political connections that even the president wish he had it. Mm -hmm. You know, and her connections were right up to the president of the United States. Huh. And um, like I said, well, it and. Uh, Harriet, his wife, died in 1908, so she wasn't a factor at all in any of this. So why well, no, would he want to save his family? You know, I mean, she had been deceased for a long, long time. and uh, Maybe because she didn't but, fit the, the proper uh, status to who he should have an heir with or something? Well, she was, she was, a, she was a, one of the hotel mates. And Pearl was a friend of the Kennedys. And we all know how well they are at covering up scandals. So, you know, it, it's, I, I just find it hard to believe Aren't all that... all political people pretty good? Are people in power good at yeah, covering I know. their scandals up for a while? And well, that's eventually true. That's everything true too. Comes, uh, comes to light and bites you in the butt. So That's right. That's right. But, um, you know, I mean, I just cannot believe that at least... Pearl did not know about this. Somebody knew that that woman was in that room. I mean, how was she fed? You know, somebody had to take food up to her. Yeah. So anyway, uh, William was in an automobile accident on March 12th of 1944, and he died on March 25th. Mm -hmm. Now, the hotel was closed in 1988, and it stood empty for almost 20 years until it was bought and restored as, as a Hilton in uh, 2007. So you can imagine right there who bought it. Um, but And it's once again open to the public, and that is anybody, you know, who can afford to pay $300 a night for the for a room. Well, this place has been on um, some paranormal shows. Yes, it has been. There have been paranormal investigations in this place. Now, the hotel is also known as the NBA Hotel, and that's because when, t when NBA teams come to town to play the Oklahoma City Thunder... They usually lose, and they blame it on not getting a full night's sleep. Well, the Hilton, uh, no, uh, the Hiltons, one of the 
I can't think of her name, but I know she's on one of those reality housewife shows. Paris. They actually, no, not Paris. That's a daughter of, but one of the, he'll, they own the, a basketball team. I can't remember. Is it the Lakers or something? And I, I might be wrong. So you guys don't get mad because I'm not like a basketball fan or whatever. I think you're right. I think they do own a basketball team, but I don't know which one it is. But now that you mention that, I think, I think you may be right. Um, and, uh, but like I said, you know, when, when NBA teams would come to Oklahoma City, they would stay at this place. And every time they did, they would lose when they'd come to Oklahoma City. And they always blamed it on not getting a full night's sleep. Maybe it's like the Knicks. Jan I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, oh, well. In January of 2010, some of the Knicks blamed their loss on lack of sleep. Like Eddie Curry claimed he only slept two hours and spent most of the night in Nate Robinson's room because he was afraid to be alone because of the paranormal activity in his room. And although he did not really give uh, <clears throat> much of an account as to what happened, mm -hmm. you know, he was still afraid to stay in that room. Uh, weeks later, Taj Gibson, Gibson of the Chicago Bulls claimed his bathroom door slammed for no reason. And Derek Rose claimed he heard strange bumps and bangs all night. Uh, ESPN's Bill Simmons claims he was startled awake by the sounds of a baby crying in his room. Uh, I would, but you know what? Here's the thing. When you have a huge hospital, okay, and there's people staying all of them, some of these things can be, you know, it could be other people there. I mean, somebody could have had a baby in another room, and maybe that's why he heard. That. But I'm not saying it. Could no, he, cla it he claims that baby crying was in his room. Right, but I'm not saying it it can't be or can be. But I'm like, there's always a possibility that it may be a living person too, creating some of these sounds. But I'm not. I'm not <clears throat> trying to um, tell people, oh no, this never happened, and your experience isn't real because almost all of us have had some kind of experience in one way or the other. Yeah. Because why else would we, we be looking for shows about the paranormal or looking for things about the cryptid? You know what I mean? Because one of us or all of us have had some type of encounter and we're looking for other people to connect with and talk about it. But yeah. when it comes to a place like this, I mean, there is a possibility for bleed through coming from the city or from other rooms. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, me. baby crying. You said that. Uh, in 2012... Jordan Hamilton of the Denver Nuggets said the hotel creeped him out every time he stayed there. And Wesley Johnson of the, of the Phoenix Suns claimed in 2013 he found his bathroom door shut and his bathtub filled with water. Oh, that's creepy. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, that uh, would be are, like the shining, you know? All you yeah, need really. to see is this weird old lady in your tub and I'd be running out the door. See ya! Yeah, I hear ya. Uh, there are claims of things being moved. A woman walking down the halls carrying a baby, a baby crying all night, door slamming. Mm -hmm. Men, including some M NBA players, have claimed that a woman will whisper in their ear, calling them by name and propositioning them. And some have even claimed of being sexually assaulted by an unseen force. Yeah. Uh, there are knocks on the doors and when, uh, when uh, someone answered, there'd be nobody there. Footsteps in the hall and, and in the rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, apparition of a woman in an old maid's uniform. And I probably should mention, after I mentioned that sexual assault, that back then, uh, this woman was considered a woman of loose morals. So, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Uh, the new owners do not want wait, staff talking. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just say women back in the day had more loose morals than they do today? I said that woman, that particular woman, back in the day was considered a woman with loose morals. Oh, sorry. Because I was like, I think the world's a little bit more corrupt now. <laughs> now <but. laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> I hear you. Um, the new owners do not want staff talking about the hauntings and the ghost. And when you ask a staff member, uh, they will smile and change the subject. But some of them will will claim that the hauntings are true. Uh, I mean, you've had all these NBA players mm -hmm. talking about Which this. Which they wouldn't you know, want these to are ruin famous, the These are yeah. famous people. They don't want to ruin right. the reputation and things like that. Right. So. 
Uh, Obviously, something scared them. Well, there have been reporters who claim that the story of Effie could not possibly have happened because it would have been impossible to cover up such a story and that the story is just a legend. But like I, you know, I gave my opinion, there were all kinds of ways to cover that story up. And maybe it might just be a legend, but still, you have these people claiming that they they hear a baby crying and they have seen the apparition of a woman carrying a baby. Some even claim that since athletes are superstitious anyway, that their imaginations just ran wild with them. I don't buy that. I really don't. And But yet, you know, every team that stays there, some of the members have a story of something unexplainable to tell. Mm-hmm. And my question is this, though. If the story of Effie is not true, mm-hmm. then why are the hauntings of a woman, why are there hauntings of a woman and a baby crying? There has to be some truth to the story. And when you think about it, most legends all have a grain of truth to them. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of things that we've done shows on and stuff where we've dug and found information and stuff that you wouldn't be kind of surprised that happened. Remember when we did a show about um, some of the deadliest women and they were doing baby farming, you know, mm-hmm. and they were killing ba- these babies and getting new ones and making money off that. There's some horrible things that ha- do happen. I mean, <sighs> something had to have happened in that hotel for mm-hmm. for for this to happen, you know, for for that particular haunting. But you have people coming and going, and you don't know what type of things that could have occurred in this place or what happened in the area or whatever else. But, you know, there is a possibility that something like this can happen and things do get covered up. I mean, look at all the stories with the Kennedys and the things that they covered (laughs) covered up. Yeah, really. Things do happen. But, you know, like you mentioned and some people in chat mentioned that this place has been on some um, paranormal shows and supposedly I, mean, I can't say if it's real or not but they had caught captured some type of evidence they, they, they caught place. EVPs they've caught orbs which I gotta be honest with you I don't put too much stock in orbs okay I and and because I see very few of them that are not dust but when I do see one that that is not dust I don't look, I don't pay attention to the orb. I start looking around it. Right. Well, because you say usually if you see an orb that's emitting its own light, it's not so much the spirit, but what you believe, it's energy gathering into one place that the apparition might be using. Well, it takes energy for them to, to appear, to, to materialize. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm not saying that there isn't the possibility that these places do or do not have activity. I mean, there's a lot of people that seem to put their job on the line, you know. And then you got, yeah, and then you got to stop and think, too, this place was a speakeasy. You know, we're talking, now you're talking gangsters, you know. And I'm sure a lot of gangsters have stayed at this place. So now you're talking possibly murders. Yeah, but you don't know what happened on the land or what was there before or what happened in the area. I don't know if you did a little true, uh, study or history to find out what... Because sometimes it may not even be essentially with the building alone well, what happened in the building, bit. but it could be what's going on around the building that may have... Yeah, on the land. Well, I do know a little bit about it, and I will actually mention that a bit in one of my other topics. But, um, but uh, at one time, when... Native Americans, uh, Oklahoma was considered Indian territory. Well, until they opened it up to the 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 uh, land rush. Right, which I'm about to talk about in the next one after we take a three minute break. But um, man, there's so much history stuff in Oklahoma. I mean, could you? I know. Wild West it's stuff, unreal. History stuff, ranching stuff. There's so many things that are so fascinating that I stumbled across when we were doing the research for paranormal things. You know what I mean? Just Oklahoma has a lot of interesting things. And that's why I really enjoy doing this stuff. And I love when people are like, hey, check this out. And then, you know, we read into it. Because oh, yeah. half the time we probably wouldn't have went and checked it out. So we, and thank that's you true. to the viewer for sending this request. But We get a lot of ideas from, from, the, from our listeners. Oh, yeah. And I love listening to their, their them, you know, emailing us and sharing their own experiences and sending us photos and things like that. But why don't we take a quick uh, three-minute break so we can get a drink of water. And then we'll continue with our um 
second half of our show because we have a bunch of more to do in Oklahoma. Um, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Please stay with us and we'll be back in three minutes. Welcome back to Anything But Ordinary. I'm your host, Raven. Spooky's back with us. Tonight's topic is Haunted Oklahoma. Um, it was a viewer's request. Thank you again to the viewer. I had kind of fun researching this show because I learned so much history alone, as well as paranormal things and just... I uh, know. Even just searching all the different ghost and <coughs> ghost towns in this place and checking out the just the historical places they have and learning about the people who moved and traversed across America to come to Oklahoma and the things that they had to go through to even, you know, make it into what it is. It was just, you know, it was cool. This is this is one of those states that we're going to have to have another part to because, I mean, it was just so difficult to pick. Which, Which places yeah. to talk about tonight? We, yeah, we only do like four or five each, you know, because it <coughs> fits into our time and whatever. But um, right. um, there was a question in chat. I don't know if you got it. People were wondering if this place, the last place that you just did, the Scriven Hotel or whatever, did it? Ha is that the one that had a train station? Uh, it had. A, it, it did have a basement, but I didn't read anything about there being a train station. It may or may not, but you just didn't happen to catch that part then. I did. I. I pretty much read. Uh, I read a lot on this place, and I there was nothing because if if there had been, I would have mentioned that. Okay, well, we well at least we try to answer the question then to the because uh, we have a live chat. 
as we do our shows live for those of you who don't catch us when we're doing them live and you're listening to the podcast we do try to interact with those in the chat room too because we learn a lot from those who are in the chat too because they have a lot oh, yeah. of interesting comments a lot of times we'll be talking about a place and there'll be somebody in that chat that knows, knows a lot, lot about it yeah. oh yeah right they'll or be they, feed, they'll be feeding us information Right, or they have some interesting things that come to the topic we're talking about, or paranormal, or because we've done shows about giants and aliens to cryptids to missing cases, and you know they'll give us ideas, and it's just, it's I love doing these shows just for the fact that we meet so many people, and that's kind of like why we started doing this is just to find other people who've had strange things, and just you know because you can't always interact with people in your real life with when it comes to these things. You know, right. because not everybody's had strange encounters and stuff. So it's nice to have a community of people come together and support each other and just talk about the experiences you had or ideas or opinions or different theories. And, and it can do it, in, and it's all coming out positive. You know, none of us are ever right. fighting. It's just, you know, it's a nice, warming place what we, we usually have bantering about. But the one of the places that I ended up picking was called the 101 Miller Ranch which uh, the main reason why I picked this was because of the whole history about this and what I read about it. And I was just like, oh, there's, we could do a whole show just on the 101 Ranch and the Wild West show that they do, you know. And um, uh, there's, like, so many videos where it's showing, like, the old times of, you know, what they were doing there and everything else. But when I kind of talk about the history and go into this... Um, you guys will know well I kind of picked it but I it's like I won't do justice to it because we have like four other ones we're doing so I'm going to kind of give it like a short version of the history of this and then go into the supposed hauntings and uh, paranormal activities and stuff but um, this is located out of um, Ponca how do you say it again Ponca 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 sorry Ponca City it's about 12, mi- 12 miles. Now I'm going to start messing up. <laughs> That's what happens when we do live shows. You never know when we're going to mess up on words. Um, it's about 12, uh, 12 miles southwest of Ponca City on Highway 156, just outside the town of Maryland, Oklahoma County, Road 190. Um, now, there was this guy. His name was Colonel George Washington Miller. Now, he was the creator of the 101 Ranch, but he was born in Crab Apple Cove, Kentucky in February of 1842. And in 1866, he married his wife, Mary Ann Carson, in um, Louisville, Kentucky, where they kind of resided there for a while on their own plantation. And then, like, you know, a couple of years into their marriage, they had, like, their first son named Joseph. And then later on, they ended up having three more children. One was George Jr. Uh, they had a daughter named Alma and uh, another son named Zach. Now, George Sr., you know, he was struggling some in Kentucky, and he decided he was going to sell his shares of the plantation and then head out to California because that's kind of like what everybody was doing back then, you know? Yeah. And um, while they were on their travels to California, they ended up staying in um, Missouri for a while, for a few years, where he and his wife had run uh, another little ranch they had created, which they uh, had... At like the LK Cattle Ranch, you know, so they did that for a while and then they sold that off and him and his family in 1880, they ended up moving to Kansas and then in 1893, George kind of leased the land in the Cherokee Strip area, which you were kind of talking about before when stuff was opening up for those. Yeah. And, and for you guys who don't know, the Cherokee Strip area, um, basically it was in 1890s, um, there was like these three sections that the Cherokee Nation had you know, acquired for, you know, basically being forced relocation to Oklahoma because they were all pushed out of their area right. and pushed into other places by the government, you know, from the Treaty of the uh, New Echota or whatever the heck it was called. But basically with all these people coming across the Americas and they were looking for land for their family to homestead or for good cattle grazing grounds and all that stuff, um, you know, sometimes they would lease some of their land for a while, the um, Cherokee and stuff but i believe later on they ended up being banned from uh cattle leasing their land for grazing uh because the government didn't want them making money i guess oh no well you know the history when you kind of read about this stuff but um 
what because they started getting banned from not leasing the land is what they ended up doing was they started to sell off parts of it to the government from anywhere to a dollar to two fifty an acre. Now the Cherokee Strip was this land south of like the Oklahoma slash Kansas border. But like I was saying, it was about 1890 when George and his family, you know, relocated about six miles uh, from the present area of, um, what did I say this town was again? Ponca. Ponca, yeah, sorry. Anyway, um, it, they moved into this uh, Indy territory of Oklahoma before Oklahoma kind of became a state. And what he ended up doing, he, he purchased uh, 2,000 acres of the prairie land and began to, you know, plow it and plant the land for, you know, kind of like for winter grazing grounds and things like that. And after the Cherokee opened up their strip for land to purchase, that's when George purchased uh, more acres as well as leasing other areas from, you know, the Ponca tribe. Because actually he befriended them when he was purchasing a bunch of land and then he would he allowed them to stay on their land because they ended up losing stuff because of the government you know what i mean or being forced to relocate mm -hmm. and things like that <clears throat> but anyway over the years it grew into about uh 110 100,000 acres or whatever it was and it became known as the 101 ranch now there's a lot more to all of this but i was kind of shortening it up here to keep with our format for because we only go till 10 o'clock but um you know, the 101 Ranch, like I said, could be a whole show topic in itself, but I will be um, posting links and reference, our references tonight where you guys can go and read in great detail, see tons of photos, and even watch um, homemade videos from back then. But George and his family, uh, they had like a really adventurous life, but the 101 Ranch was one of the largest diversified farms in America at that time. Now, George Sr., he passed away in April of 1903 at the age of 61, and his three sons continued on with the operation of the farm and the ranch. But they had, like, sometimes... There's my cat pounding at the door again. They, he's always coming in for the show. But there's, like, they had over 25,000 long... Or 25... Yeah, what is it? Longhorns or whatever. They had 10,000 yeah. hogs. They had their own pack, uh, packing plant ice and cold storage place. They had a tannery. They had their own cider mill. They had their own electric power plant. They had their own dairy and cannery plant. They had their own general store. And at one point, they even discovered oil on their land. So they started to produce their own gasoline and kerosene, you know, stuff like that. And they ended up calling it the 101 Ranch Oil Company. Uh, they had their own mail and telephone service. Wow. They had their own school hotel and newspaper so this place was like a little mini city of their own that they built over the years on their land and they even created their own money so that you know it could be used on their property for purchasing items from the stores and such by the employees that lived and worked on the farm in the ranch area and the the house that they had the main house where the family lived it was called the white house so at one point they had over 3,000 people that had lived there. And it was somewhere in 1905 when the brothers decided, hey, let's branch out, because they didn't have enough on their plate already, you know. <laughs> but let's yeah. branch out into the entertainment area. So that's when they asked, you know, they're like, hey, you know, the Editorial Associ Association of, you know, Bliss. They're like, hey, come out here and come check out our place. And that's when they held, like, this thing called the Oklahoma Gala Day. And it was this event where the employees basically showed off their skills, you know, like a Wild West show. They had horses and roping and <coughs> riding. They had people doing their shooting skills. They had native dancers. They had people wrestling steers, you know, all that kind of rodeo stuff, you know. Uh, but they had also famous people coming here and being a part of this because they had people like Geronimo. Now, he was a prisoner for a while during that time, remember? Yeah. But they ended yes, up he was. talking... Uh, the place that he was staying in the prison or whatever like hey let him come out here because he's almost gonna be dead and let him shoot a couple buffaloes you know so geronimo yeah. made an appearance he was riding in the back of this car and he shot his bow and arrow and hit the buffalo a couple of times but i mean he didn't die right away of course so they shot it you know but they allowed you know geronimo was there they had buffalo bill they had bill pickett man this cat's driving me nuts but they had bill pickett who was a part of this. Now, I think he was like that huge, you know, cowboy movie star. You know what I'm talking about? But yeah. they had Buffalo... I think, he, I, I think he was a silent film star or something. Yeah. They had the um, a buffalo hunt in the arena. And then they would have a barbecue with people they could uh, buy a buffalo sandwich for like 50 cents. 
Now, when I say buffalo hunt, I'm not saying, like, every vi- visitor who came there were, like, psh, 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 shooting up buffalo. That's not what I meant. But, right. you know, maybe somebody from the the event that was transpiring, you know, they would be there to do it. But um, they also had bands playing, and they had huge parades. And um, it was just an amazing thing that I was reading about and watching the old films and stuff. But the show was so successful that Joe Miller and his brothers um, – formed the 101 Ranch Wild West show, and they began to tour the whole United States in 1907. And then by um, 1914, the 101 uh, Ranch Wild West show (laughs) began to tour (laughs) internationally. So, I mean, they were really just going all about. But they were like the first ones to really produce movie pictures back then because they were filming all these things and all these famous people. Because I think there was other people there besides the ones I was talking about. But who was that? Um, oh, what was that lady's name? Oh, I don't know. There was a lot of famous Western people that you know about. That Annie were, Oakley? I don't know if it was exactly her, but there was a lot of these famous people who were, wanted to be a part of the Wild West show and go on these tours internationally and all across the United States. But um, they this thing lasted for 35 years. So it was like from 1905 to 1935, you know, and, I, and this farm ranch place was basically like its own little city that was ran by this family. But um, it's kind of like what I, from what I was read, I basically 35 years, I'm assuming, because that's kind of like what I was picking up on most sites. But Joe, the eldest son, he passed away on the ranch in 1927 while he was working on his car. Now, he, they said he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Which is kind of weird because I, 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 I would assume they would be working outside or whatever. But from what I was reading, he actually had the car running while he was working on it in this building. But the doors, I guess, were partially open. And, you know, he had all these tools and things. i got to let the cat out because he's going to stop pounding on the door. But, he, you know, um, he was working on well, it. Well, back then, they didn't really know about carbon monoxide poisoning. True. But... I, at first, I didn't know if like he got pulled into the car or if it was carbon monoxide because the way that they were wording things, it made me wonder like what it was, you know. And it also kind of made you suspicious, like did somebody help assist in this or whatever? But I'm just gonna say it was carbon monoxide. Basically, was what they were apparently pushing at. But the way they worded so many things, it made you kind of question it. But after Joe's death is when they begin to kind of struggle some with the ranch and such. So you have George Jr. He died in a car accident in 1929 after his car skidded off the road during the icy storm. Basically, he was in town over, and it it was kind of a wintry thing, and they were playing poker and stuff, and then he's like, I bet you I can make it home. And they're like, no, dude, stay here. Don't, you know, it's not safe. And he's like, I can do it. And then he took off, and he didn't make it. Now, um, Zach, he was the last of the brothers. He kept the the Wild West show going for a few more years, and then he ended it in the 1930s. Now, Zach passed away in 1952. Now, like I said, there is so much to the 101 Ranch that I was basically kind of squashing it all and summarizing it up a lot. Paraphrasing. <laughs> yeah, but I do suggest you guys to go read about it because it's super amazing. But after Zach died, you know, the F... FSA, and they, you know, they came, they divided up and sold parts of the land, and, you know, many of the buildings were taken down, as well as the 101 White House building. Now, the 101 Ranch store, it remained standing up until September of 1987, and basically, I guess it caught on fire, but nobody really knows how it caught on fire, but it burnt down. But there are 82 acres of the ranch that were put on the National Historic Landmark in 1975. Now, in the 1990s, the Oklahoma Oklahoma <laughs> legislator <laughs> designated the state Highway 156 as the 101 Ranch Memorial Road. Now, there is a historical marker, and it's located on the highway about 13 miles southwest of um, that little town I was talking about. But... There are people who say that this area is kind of active at times, but there were known deaths that have occurred over the years on the ranch while they were in operation. Because you had, like I said, you had both George Sr. and Jr. who passed away there, and the mom. Um, Bill Pickett, he died from being kicked in the head from a steer. Because he got kicked in the head on the farm. Of course, they took him to the nearby hospital, but 
Um, it's still kind of a tragic event that occurred on the place. You also have, um, he's actually buried near the stone um, monument to White Eagle on the land. You also have a guy named James Curbstone Kirby. Um, uh, he's buried there. He died on there. There was a, a person called Henry Clay. He's um, buried there. You have a nine-year-old little girl named, um, I can't remember her first name, but her uh, her last Gladys. name Glad But her last name's Hamilton. Now, she <clears throat> died there, and she's buried on the land. And then there was a person, his name was Jim Gates. Now, he was shot at one of the dances. I can't imagine what he did to cause enough sturge to get himself killed while he was there but uh he died and, and was buried there but i guess you know according to all these different websites there's several others there that are buried in the cemetery and some things that you know people died from illnesses and things like this because this place was in operation for like a long time you know and you have people coming and going and you had such right. um events taking place and just the energy being held there and things like that so i'm sure if they really loved well not only that but the people who actually live there all the time you know, I mean, I'm sure they died of natural causes or ranch accidents or something, and they're probably all buried there, or most of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, not everybody, because, like, um, some of the family members are not, they're not buried there. They're buried in um, other places, like in right. uh, Kentucky, back home, and, and things like that. But... Um, just because of the things that took in place there and how much people loved going there, visitors and the people who worked there, I could imagine why, if if the afterlife does exist, why they probably would want to carry on, you know what I mean, or even just residual things occurring there. But people have talked about seeing shadow beings in the area. Um, they've talked about being touched or they've seen things being tossed at them when they were in some of the buildings that were still there. Uh, people have captured EVPs and they've seen, you know, these light orbs, whatever they may be, energy, as you say, not so much spirits. Uh, people yeah. have talked about being followed or watched. They hear disembodied footsteps. They hear music and voices, you know. And some have actually even said that they've seen apparitions of cowboys or even Native Americans because they had Native Americans living there at the, uh, on the, um, some of the land that George Senior had owned. Because, like I said, he allowed them to live there so that they wouldn't be forced out. And they were friends with the Ponca tribe. And um, at times when people would come, he would go and ask if they would come and perform. And I hate saying that because it just sounds so awful. Like, hey, come perform for these people, you know. But they would come and show them, the, you know, their, their um, dances or, you know, some of their games they would play, like stickball and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It was just so fascinating reading about the 101 Ranch, and I could understand why there is some activity that's still occurring on this land, just because of how much love that occurred I know, for that their was jobs and um, rodeos and, and famous mm -hmm. people being there. And it's, oh, man, I, I'm going to put a link, you know, so you guys can watch some of the old-time films of this stuff. But it's definitely something to go read about. There's books on it. There's tons of websites websites I would like to go you know. see that place well there's only a few places still left but like what's left you know they have it's on the historical registry thing and they have a little marker so it won't be hard to miss you know what I mean but mm -hmm. um a lot of the land around it is owned by people so I mean you have to be respectful of other landowners and stuff but if you are going through the area and you're Traveling through Oklahoma, hit some of these spots up, you know, just, you know, don't go to some of the places where you're trespassing, but at least drive by, you know, <laughs> it's worth yeah, doing really. a drive by, but just, there is a museum in a different town, I forgot what it is, but when I, uh, after tonight, I'll go look up the link again and post it, where they have a museum about the 101 Ranch with all these photos and more information about the people who lived and the activity there and people who died there and things like that, but it's definitely worth uh, looking into for sure. I loved researching this one. <laughs> I bet. Sounds like a great one. It was. There was just so many interesting people involved in this place. And and not even that, before the 101 Ranch was even made, the, the life that George Sr. had made, because he had already had like three or four different ranches in different spots. And the fact that a lot of people were pushing the native tribes out of their homeland and forcing them. I know, to, and he allowed them to live there. Well, he respected them, yeah. you know what I mean? And... <laughs> You know, he 
gave him jobs and things like that. And he wasn't, you know, he was trying to be respectful for the situation that was going on by the government and other people. You know what I mean? But he well, befriended Well, from what him. I read on it, too, everybody that, just about everybody that knew this guy liked him. Yeah. You know, and, and respected him because he was, con he was considered, you know, a, a very kind and honest man. Yes. And very caring. The family is very caring. They were taking people in, yeah. giving them jobs. They created their own little city. They had their own money system, you know, and it was obviously working for them until, you know, the, the main contender started to pass away. And then right. with that much oh, businesses and everything else, it's a lot of work for one person to take on or two people alone. And, you know, I know. With age that, that would be a lot of work now. Right. Can you imagine what it was back then? No. It just everything, you know, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't put up your cameras, you know, and look at a certain area to see what's going on or you didn't have your electronics to do your your well, book you work had for good you. Work. I mean, everything was done by hand. You had to get right out there. It was everything was hands on. Well, it still is if you're a farmer or a rancher, but you oh, trust on, you trust on the people that you hire and stuff. But I mean, it was very functional. And then they decided to to say, hey, let's have entertainment stuff and that stuff. You know, just everything they put their hand to, it turned gold. It was amazing. Just these people come from yeah. they came from nothing. He came from nothing and created such an amazing thing. And it's 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 a, it's great history to learn about these people throughout history. You know, that helped build our country you know in a way but uh why exactly. don't you go ahead and do your next one spooky okay mine is the chickasaw national recreation area uh, and veterans lake in uh sulfur outside of sulfur oklahoma now this is a 9889 acre park that sits at the foothills of the arbuckle mountains which, by the way, are the are the oldest known formations in the United States between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, of all these acres, 2,409 of them are water. Uh, I'm talking lakes, natural springs, creeks, you know, it's all of that. And it is actually a combination of several different parks. Now, the Sulphur Springs Reservation uh, the Platte National Park and the Arbuckle Recreation Area, just to name a few. Uh, it's open to the public, and in agreement with the Chickasaw Indian Nation, there is no admission fee. Now, when the, Ch when the Choctaw and the Chickasaw tribes were forced from their lands in southeast United States, they settled here and found out that this new land had natural fresh mineral springs, which they believed were had healing powers. But they were afraid that the land would fall into the hands of developers, like what happened to Hot Springs, Arkansas. So in 1902, they sold 640 acres to the United States government, and it was named the Sulphur Springs Reservation. <clears throat> it became the seventh and smallest national park in the United States, and it's the only national park in Oklahoma. Now, in the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, developed the park's infrastructure, which included pavilions, gazebos, landscaping. Uh, their goal was to create a peaceful and scenic oasis, and they succeeded. Uh, the infrastructure they developed is preserved to this day. And in 2011, the park was designated a National Historic Landmark. Now, this park offers hiking trails, boating, fishing, swimming, and other activities. Uh, there is actually more to the history, but to name all the small lakes and areas and parks and dates, it would take a while, so I decided to shorten it a bit. Well, right, we can't do, like... We could do so much more on each place, but we kind of shorten it up because we try to fit as much exactly. in. Exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having problems with my throat. Uh, Veterans Lake is located in the western area of the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. Now, this is a 67-acre man-made lake that was built in 1933, and it's named in honor of American War veterans. Uh the American Legion of the area has something to do with it. 
also. It has three miles of shoreline. It has hiking trails, picnic areas, modern restrooms. It's even wheelchair accessible. And you're allowed to fish and take out small boats, but it is a no-wake lake, which means that you have a speed limit on this lake. Uh, it has a boat dock, it has a fishing dock, and it has ghosts. The story is that a woman, in, this happened in the 1950s. A woman and her young son were on the shore near the water, and the woman turned for just a moment to look at something, and when she looked back, her son was in the water drowning. So she jumped in, and while she was trying to save her son, she drowned. Her and her son both drowned. Now, people claim to have seen her apparition hovering above the lake, and it is claimed that she will call out to people. And it's also said that she tries to entice people into the lake, but this claim really cannot be confirmed. Um, a couple years later, well, how do you young... confirm? You mean the the, the death of, of her and her son can't be confirmed no, because people she, can't that find she calls any... out. No, that she calls out to people trying to get them into the lake so they'll drown. Well, that's that's the thing about the paranormal. I mean, people can't ever. There's I know you really be, can't confirm it. You just got to go on people's words because right. there are people that said that they have been there and she has called them by name. Yeah, and people and, are like, well, why and, didn't you get it recorded? Okay, sometimes when things happen, your brain, for whatever reason, is like, oh, quick, let me pull out my phone and record the thing that I'm saying. It doesn't. You're more like in shock, like. Is the, I can't believe what's playing out in front of my eyes at this moment. And people are not, and and the majority of people that go to this place, they're not know nothing for about it. this history, or they're not even looking for it. They're they're, they're going out there to time. have a picnic. They're going out there, you know, to whatever. Float around in their boats or whatever, you know. <laughs> float around. Float their boats, I thought I thought you were going to say float around in their tubes, at, you know. But yeah. No, no, most or people swim. You can swim there. Of, you know. Yeah. I mean, fish. you can't water ski, but you know, you can float your boat out there. I would love to go um, on the trails. It looks so beautiful. Yeah, it does. Dude, it's snowing uh, here, so I'm totally ready for summertime. So this picture is just. I like, hear you. Oh, it's heaven. the wind outside is kicking up. I'm starting to get a little concerned. Um, a well, if you see your neighbor later, fly by, just buck your seatbelt in. Yeah, I hear you. A couple years later, a young girl drowned in a boating accident, and her apparition has also been seen on the shoreline and in the water. Now, this apparition seems to be residual since no one has claimed that she interacts with anyone, mm -hmm. only that she's been seen, you know, she'll be walking along the shoreline and then just disappears. Maybe it's uh, like a there, residual thing, possibly. Yeah. There is also no particular time of the day or night that these spirits are seen. It could happen anytime. People have seen this in the daytime. They've seen it in the evening. Uh, this the the park has hours, so you know if somebody goes in there after hours, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure they have it. seen her. There's though well, there has been a few reports of people going in there after hours. Uh, people claim that during the day they get an unfe uneasy feeling <clears throat> around the lake. Excuse me. And also the feeling of being watched besides these apparitions. They say that these feelings get worse at night. So if you go there, be careful. There, there have been several drownings in this lake. And as a bonus, be very, very careful because the Chickasaw National Recreation Area has a Bigfoot. And there have been several reports of this creature, especially along the creeks and the small rivers, but there, there's so far there's been no reports of it being aggressive. It's just, you know, people see it crouched down, I guess, fishing, whatever it's doing by the river. Oh, don't mind you that. Know, or they see it he walking. Always fish. That's they, his fishing spot. Just yeah, don't, it up. Don't, don't pay attention to that. That's his favorite fishing spot. Yeah. But, but there have been reports of a Bigfoot in there. Did you read that on the BFR website or whatever? Some of the Bigfoot no, I, sightings, or was, I read you just it, read it when you were checking all these different. When sites I out? when I was when I was researching this place, uh -huh. there was a story in there about a guy that dropped his brother off. Okay, it was one of the stories. He dropped his brother off. Uh, his brother was out there going to party with some people or whatever. They were going to spend the night or whatever because there is camping there. Cool. And um, anyway, uh, he dropped his brother off with. Uh, 
his brother's supposed to be out there with a group of people, and he was coming back, and as he was coming back, he noticed this thing that was crouched down by the water like it was fishing or drinking or something, mm -hmm. and he stopped his car, and he got out and looked, and it looked up at him, and it stood up, and he said it was about eight feet tall, and it turned around and walked into the forest. And he said he knew it was a Bigfoot, and come to find out, this guy uh, was a Bigfoot uh, researcher, because he had seen a Bigfoot before. He wasn't, you know, like a big name guy. Or well, anything. yeah, he's just somebody but who he, had an encounter. But, but he's one of these guys that he's one of these guys that had an encounter, and of course, a lot of times when people have these encounters, they get obsessed with with hunting them down. Now, the know, hunting's not the right word. They're not looking to shoot or kill, but more to the, confirm what they have actually seen with their eyes is real. Because exactly. once you have an encounter, you always question like. Uh, you know, and you Did know, I really see that? Yeah. You know, so you want to make sure. Am I going crazy? Get, whatever. And then you, exactly. And then when you start to have more experiences, then you're like, well, you you want to investigate more. Like, what well, is this? What is that? Blah blah blah. Yeah, you know? appar but apparently, this particular guy, he had had an encounter, and he came. Uh, he became obsessed with with finding Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And he had been through this park, this national forest or National Park lots of times, mm -hmm. and he had never seen anything. It just so happens this one particular day is when he spotted it. Mm -hmm. So now he knows that there's a Bigfoot in there, so I'm sure by now he's going in there looking for it. Right. Well, you've had experiences, and you know kind of like... Yeah, but I don't go looking for it. <laughs> it's too big. And I'm only 5'4". Yeah. Well... But... <laughs> I but anyway I would go looking for it I suppose but the thing is you know some people in chat are like maybe he was just down by the water floating his boat and Doppel was like no Bigfoot don't go down by the water she's calling your name to drown you things like that in chat so chat's kind of cracking me up too but I think that's fascinating you know but that's the thing that happens in a lot of these national state parks and forests and also the native land and stuff that's protected and preserved this there seems to be a lot of cryptids that are um, seen, but also the Na Native Americans have such a long history and, and stories and encounters when it comes yeah. to not just Bigfoots, but different hominoids and, and things. Right, and this is not the only national park that I have ever reported on that had a Bigfoot in there. When I was researching paranormal in places, you know, I mean, I'd be I'd be researching a place like this one place in Indiana. I think it was southern Indiana. I was researching this park, I can't, National Forest. I can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head. But I was researching the paranormal, and then Bigfoot pops up. Mm -hmm. You know, reports of Bigfoot pops up. So you don't know what you're going to find when when you're reporting on these things. You know, you well, might go in there looking for looking for one. Um, idea, you know, well, I'm going to report paranormal, on the paranormal, and then you turn around and a cryptid pops up. Or alien, or this. Or, or an alien, or, or missing or something, cases. You know? But with me, it's mostly, yeah, or missing people. Ca missing but people. With me, in the it's area. mostly been Bigfoot pops up. Well, there's a lot of dogman things going on, too. But there's a lot of interesting things, but we still have to start doing those cryptid states, too. But Or big cats. You know, yeah, that's, cats that's that another one. Supposedly aren't supposed to be in living in the state, but they are like your state. Right. You know, the DNR's like, sorry, lady, you're not seeing no cougar. And I'm like, well, it's pooping in my yard. So I think I kind of know what I'm seeing. Was, you know, oh or your gosh. neighbor. Or I could do an entire show on my phone call to the DNR yeah. over a cougar. Yeah. This place sounds really fascinating. Just even just the picture alone, just it's inviting. I'm like, I go check it out. But, you know, when you I do know, it go looks like into, a gorgeous place. Yeah, but when you do go and, into the wilderness, I mean, you guys have to be mindful. I mean, you are in nature and things can happen, you know, just by from wildlife to, like you said, a lot of people seem to drown in the area. Hopefully, I mean, that's... Well, it, it's not, it, it's only in this veteran's lake. Really? Hmm. You know, yeah, it, that's where most of the drownings are reported in this veteran's lake. You know, I mean, there have been, you know, maybe one drowning, you know, maybe in one of the other lakes or something. You know, I mean, nothing like this Veterans Lake. And I'm not saying there's hundreds that's drowned there. Don't get oh, me wrong. Okay. 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 There hasn't been hundreds of people drowned in that, in that lake. But there have been, you know, several drownings there. 
And um, like I said, one of the reports are that, uh, of course, nobody's going to believe them, you know, but they'll report this woman hovering above the water, you know, calling their name, trying to entice them into the water. Isn't there like a theory that people have had where water can trap people's spirits or, you know, something with water has in and, and spirit act? Because wasn't there like old folklore where... Like, if you ran across the bridge and made it past the river, you would escape the, the upper, you know, like, Irish I know, stuff and thing. That, you know what I'm talking about. That's what about. it was. You know, they, they tell you, they say, you know, spirits, ghosts can't cross water. That's BS. Or they can get trapped. Well, obviously, because too many things that are people are seeing. But then again. I've seen it happen. But then again. Okay. <laughs> but then again, I'm not, I'm not going to downplay these people's experiences. But we have well, to. Well, I'm not either. But we also have to flip the other coin. Maybe the when they thought they were possibly seeing a white apparition, could it have just been the environment creating a fog or mist? You know, I, and well, they were you from know, afar. Anything, anything is a possibility. But how do you explain the young girl walking along the shoreline and then just suddenly disappear? Right. You know. Oh, I but mean, I'm that's... I'm just trying to offer both sides. You know, because that's what we try to do. I'm not trying to make like we just present what we read and then leave it all up to you guys to decide if you want to believe or not believe yeah and of course we have our own anything. opinions exactly but this is definitely a very interesting place too but when you're out in the wilderness you never really know i what would go you're there come across. well you you just said you probably wouldn't because you weren't you know you're i wouldn't to, swim in veterans lake but i would probably go there she'd be she'd be one around floating in a boat and then she'd see bigfoot there too making his paper boat out of trees and leaves and pushing it. You, you'd you be the one who would run into Bigfoot again. Because you were the one who told me that one night when you were driving your car, this thing ran across the road, which was really creepy. He didn't run across the road. He jumped out and stood in the middle of the road and looked at me. Yeah, looked at your truck. Yeah. yeah. That was creepy. Um, do you want me to go on to my next one? Are you? Uh, yes, please. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were done with your so I didn't yeah, want to you. I'm not done. <laughs> No, done with that one. I'm done with that one. Okay. Um, but it, I do think water is kind of, because there were some shows we watched with the paranormal where they were getting EVPs from underneath the water. Remember when they had Josh Gates and Destination America or whatever it was? Well, that was they went down, too. you know, they sent cameras and stuff down where the Edmund Fitzgerald is, and they found uh, there were apparitions in, in, in the wheelhouse Oh, uh, yeah. The USS Arizona down in Hawaii. There's I've seen were pictures where they where they've taken pictures, you know, yeah. from the platform, and there were faces show up in the in the portholes. So that so would it, freak me out more. Is the Titanic? That's another one. Remember that uh, person we know that posted that picture of the Titanic? No. And there was a guy standing there. The Titanic. Yeah, on the Titanic. I don't. Are you talking about? Um, I only remember the guy we had come on who did a different show. It was a, what was that? It was Mary. No, she, po she posted, uh, she posted a picture of the Titanic. I think it was on her wall or something because we were talking about, uh, this was when I was on that other show. Oh, this is like eons and ago. So it's been, that. yeah, it was eons ago. And, uh, but she posted that, we happened to be talking about, um, underwater spirits and stuff. And she posted that picture that someone had taken of the Titanic, you know, sent that thing down and took that picture. And there was a guy standing on the deck. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe we should do a show on something with water and, uh, paranormal and stuff. Cause there yeah. are a lot of interesting things that people talk about, but, um, the one, the next one I picked was Willock Academy which is located on Madison, uh, Southeast Street or whatever, in Millerton, Oklahoma, in um, McCurtain County. Now, this was in 1832. There was this guy, his name was Reverend Alfred Wright, and his wife, Harriet, they kind of established this mission station, which they dubbed Wheelock, because they kind of named it after the, one of their friends. And, you know, they had this church built and, you know, like a year or so later, they had like this little school kind of built. And what they did is they kind of provided um, uh, kind of like uh, educational Christian ministry type of thing to the Choctaw in the area. They also gave, you know, some medical aid and stuff. But according to some of the sites, the rights originally were in Mississippi 
doing their missions until the Choctaw tribes were forced to relocate to Oklahoma in the 1830s. So they kind of packed up their stuff and went along with them. Now, in 1839, there was this uh, dormitory that was built for the children to stay who kind of, because there were some of them who lived really far away, so they had to travel back and forth a lot. And so they decided that they would build this place where the kids could just stay there and continue on with their uh, Americanization into, you know what I mean? Uh, But um, it wasn't just also them. They also would uh, allowed, I don't want to say allowed, but they gave a home for also those who became orphans or were orphans, you know what I mean? But uh, it was in um, 1842 when I believe it was 1842 when Wheelock became a national school now the Choctaw they ended when it became a national school that's when they um hi- hired the rights to continue on you know Alfred and Harriet to kind of continue on with their teachings and you know run the school because by that time when it switched over it was no longer a day school but it became for boys um both boys and girls but it ended up becoming like only a female seminar so only all the girls stayed there and went to schooling there and stuff when it became, you know, part of this national school, from what my understanding is from reading. But the kids that attended there at that time were kind of like between the ages of 10 and 16. And what they were is they were kind of taught the English language. They were taught a religion, not, you know, of course, they're not their spiritual belief system, but they were kind of forced to um, learn whatever different religion at the time they were pushing you know some type of christian religion anyway uh and i'm not knocking christianity so please don't take it that way i was just trying to explain what was going on at the time for these children um they were learning reading and writing and math and you know kind of like sewing and kind of like how to do household daily chores and you know basically other people's um beliefs and stuff like that who came across from different countries or basically teaching the Choctaw teaching their, them their how ways. to teaching them how to be little Americans nice Americanized type housewives people. yeah whatever not house but anyway so many of them you know they weren't all that happy about being forced to um, Americanization you know basically having to assimilate into these new belief systems and ways and having to drop theirs you know to be you know kind of being told like oh you know yours isn't right do this right which i I wouldn't be happy with that either which always happens all the time throughout history no matter where you're at you know and it's a kind of a sad thing that humans do to other humans but right uh, i'm not saying it is it's very sad but i'm not saying everybody who was there was unhappy but there were obviously some people you know who probably had felt that way because it was talked about on some sites but um, I guess I wouldn't be happy either if I was kind of, if all that happened to me, I was forced to relocate, I was forced to change my belief system and forced to believe somebody else's, you know, and, and whatever else. It's a real eye opener, you know, but also learning, you know, and everything else is also a positive for them so that they could function with how the world was changing around them. But anyway, Mr. Wright, uh, he ended up passing away in 1853, and in 1861, the school shut down during the Civil War, which makes sense because you have yeah. the whole country up in arms. But Mrs. Wright, she ended up relocating to Florida because she ended up having some health issues. And um, there's this guy, his name was Reverend John Edwards. He ended up replacing the couple, the Wrights, and they ended up running the school. Now, the school was reopened in um, 1865 when, you know, when the war and all that stuff was done or whatever. And um, so he was running it for a while. But it was in 1869 that I ended up reading that the place was almost destroyed by fire. Some fire happened. I'm not sure how it happened, but it it took out a lot of the buildings and stuff. And... um, the ones that kind of remained were either partially damaged or some of them still some of them still were saved or whatever but they would still use them the partially burnt ones for their schooling and stuff or whatever and i think it was like somewhere around 1880s when um the willock academy building were built by the choctaw tribe that pictures we're kind of looking at now with some of the aid of uh some presbyterian missionaries and uh, i think like the indian bureau agents you know the government 
a little bit, kind of help them. But the school was reopened in 1884 as, and you know, of course, as the years went on, the school expanded and they added several more buildings. And then in 1910, the U.S. government, um, I guess, took over funding up until 1932. And the school continued to run up until 1955 until it was like shut down. And I believe the ownership was returned around back to the Choctaw Nation around that time from the government. They're like, here you go. And so they began to try to restore many of the buildings. Now, in 1965, the Willowack was put on National Historic Landmark, and in 1966, it was put on the National Registry, and it's been kind of on, it's one of the higher up numbers uh, for America's most endangered place list, you know, so you guys can donate to them to help uh, fix up these places and to keep them going, you know what I mean? Uh, keep the building preserved or whatever. But while in operation, they had over 18 buildings. And, there, you know, there's still a few of these still standing today, which you can go and see. But uh, they have the Stone Presbyterian Church that was built by the Wrights. Uh, they have the administra um, administration building from the 1880s. And there's a museum inside one of the, I think it was like the LaFleur Wooden Dormitory Building. That's where the museum is. And not far from the buildings is the Children's Cemetery. Now, there's a lot more history to this and um, other Native schools in Oklahoma. That could be a whole show topic oh, in I itself. Know. And I think we were talking about possibly doing that one day, too, about the, the all these different schools and stuff. But I didn't really do justice to this tonight because we have a limited time. But, um, you know, like we said, we're going to end up probably doing more. A, a different show just strictly on that uh, the academies and the things that gone on there but i i do have links that i'm going to put in the references for you guys to go check out so if you do want to read more on the history of wheelock you can but as far as the paranormal hauntings go um i read on different sites that they talk about um that there was some girls that were murdered there but oh my. i couldn't really locate uh a lot of detail or newspaper clippings or whatever in the time period that we were doing in the two weeks that we were researching but there was also people who passed away there due to illnesses, you know, like you have pneumonia or, you know, scarlet fever, yellow fever, all that kind of stuff back then that people would catch and, and pass away. And there was talk of people that were supposedly, you know, I can't confirm this or not, you know, but supposedly there were some people that were mistreated that could have uh, died due to that. But there really isn't any factual evidence, I suppose, to back that up. But I'm, I'm not going to say that it didn't or did happen because there is a possibility that stuff can happen back then because of the way that right. they were treated back then by some people. You know what I mean? But um, Right. And, and I'm not trying to knock the good that came from this place either. I'm just saying this is what's talked about. I'm not trying to push one way or the other. But some say... You know, um, when people are visiting there, they talk about having these experiences. They say they've seen lights floating around in the church. I suppose like glowing orbs or something that looks like a lantern, but it's not really there. They talk about hearing, you know, disembodied voices and footsteps in different buildings or on the grounds itself uh, where this school was. Um, they talk about, you know, when they're in part of the school area, uh, you know, where they have the chalkboards and things like that, that when, when people were standing there, there was things that flew through the air, you know, that were sitting somewhere and was tossed by, unvis you know, by nobody, you know, something made something fly through the air, but there was no physical body that did it, did this um, action. They also talk about doors opening, closing behind them when they're there and nobody being there. Um, people talk about seeing um, full body apparition of a, a young girl sometimes watching them through a window. There's people who talked about seeing a, a young girl walking up the stairs of the academy and then she would just disappear right in front of their eyes. Um, there's people who have the feeling that they're being watched or touched while they're in the cemetery or followed type of feeling, you know what I mean? Um, there was a native paranormal group or two of them I think that I read on the internet where, you know, they were luckily allowed to actually have an investigation uh, investigation there but i think the reason why they were allowed is because they were native in choctaw or whatever um yeah. but they had captured some evps and and photos and such while they were there now um if you are interested in visiting willock you can tour the grounds and the museum only not the academy part but it is owned by the choctaw nation of oklahoma and um, the museum is in uh, 
the refurbished LeFleur, LeFleur, I think that's how you say it, hall. And basically in this museum, um, it kind of exhib shows exhibits of how the school was back then and the lives of the students. It, it, you know, it shows a lot of historic photographs and personal items or, you know, like different artifacts and stuff. And, you know, like I said, you can tour of the museum and the grounds are available upon request. So you kind of have to contact them and ask if you can come out because I, I don't think it's open like all the time. But if you contact them, the Choctaw Nation uh, people of Oklahoma ahead of time, you can possibly set up where you can come out and you know, like visit those certain parts. But each year they do have like a um, reunion for the people who are, you know, surviving alumni who went to the Wheelock Academy, you know what I mean? So, but I thought that sounds this was like an interesting place. Well, right. And of course, when you're reading about Oklahoma and things like that, and a lot, and oh, it happens, there's a lot of stuff in different states, not just Oklahoma, okay? But, it, you know, there's different things that occur. There were several of those boarding schools, too, for academies. Native Americans. Yeah, and the things that we were reading they, about it. Yeah, they called academies. And uh, we, we did talk about doing a show on those because the history on those were very, very interesting. And some of them were even sad. Right. Well, basically, people were forced to move out of another state and relocate into a different section. And then, not even that, they were forced out of where they've been living for years and years and years, and, yeah. and, and then they're pushed into another state, and then they're forced to assimilate and become Americanized. You know, there's a lot of exactly. history to this. But it's not all 100% sad, but I think it's something we're talking about and sharing with because a lot of this stuff's yeah. not talked about anymore. And it is something that's interesting, you know what I mean? And I right. think people should be aware of our past, just so, one, we don't repeat it, and two, it's something worth learning. And I'm not saying all these places were awful and horrible, because right. there was a lot of happiness, there was a lot of love, there was a lot of care, there was medical, and all this stuff, too. So, you know, by any means, we're not trying to, like, be negative, we're just basically sharing the history of it. But I yeah. can see why that there could be activity in, in an academy just like this, just because of the things that have occurred there, you know, be it bad or, mm -hmm. or good, you know, and, yeah. and be it residual, whatever. But I do find it fascinating while people are there, and they're not really so much there for the activity, but they're there to learn the history. But to see um, apparitions or to see things fly across your, you know, right in front of your face or doors shut, you know, that. Well, I'm sure some go there for the history, some go there for the paranormal activity. Maybe. You know. Um, we still have a couple more to do, so we're going to be running over oh, a little yeah. bit tonight. We're just a little chatty tonight, but I'm sure you guys yeah, don't care. Yeah, just a little bit. But, I, you know, thanks again to the viewer, because me and you found so many fascinating things tonight to do. But why I don't know. you go ahead and, and do your next one? Uh, Fort Reno, which is near El Reno. Um, Fort Reno was first established as a temporary camp near the Darling Agency in July of uh, 1874. Now, this was an Indian agency on the Cheyenne and Arapaho Indian Reservation, and it was named for its first agent, uh, Brenham Darling. Now, its purpose at the time was to protect the agency from the Red River War, which was a military campaign by the U.S. Army to forcibly remove the Comanche, Kiowa, Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes from the southern uh, the southern plains to re relocate them to reservations in Indian territory in 1874. Now you have to remember that Indian territory, at least the biggest part of it, was in Oklahoma until they opened it up to the settlers. Now the so-called war only lasted a few months and even though there were some skirmishes, casualties were really not that many. In fact, the tribes did not have the strength for this fight due to the lack of, of supplies. <coughs> Excuse me. In mid-1875, the last remaining uh, substantial group surrendered and this was what marked the end of the free roaming Indian populations on the southern Great Plains. Now basically the army ran them until they could run no more. On July 15th in 1874 it was established as a permanent fort and its main purpose was to control and protect the southern Cheyenne and southern Arapaho reservations. 
and also to oversee the great land rush and to control Sooners. Now, Sooners were people who tried to move in and grab unassigned lands, lands before the, the land rush. Uh, the fort That's was a whole named, show in itself, too. <laughs> I know, that land rush, that just... That's a whole show right there. Mm -hmm. uh, the fort was named for El Reno, which still exists, and Reno City, which was abandoned just before Oklahoma statehood. Now, Oklahoma became a state in 1907, and the fort was abandoned in February of 1908. It, remained, it did remain a quartermaster remount depot, which provided horses, mules, and dogs to army units. Uh, during World War II, it was used to house German and Italian POWs. As a matter of fact, the chapel was built by the Africa Corps, which was the German force in North Africa during World War II. It was filled Marshal Rommel's campaign. Now, in 1949, it was completely abandoned by the Army, and it was transferred to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, we all know what that is. Um, there is a cemetery there, and it holds the remains of German and Italian POWs, settlers, and military personnel. Mm -hmm. And one of the more notable persons buried there is Ben Clark, who was a frontier scout for George Armstrong Custard, Custer. I don't know why I say Custard. Custer and Philip Sheridan. Hey, Custard is good stuff. But, hey, we're, yeah, doing, we're doing live shows. We're going to mess up on words. You got people watching. You know, we're human. It's okay to make mistakes. Now, in 1970, the fort was added to the National Registry, Register of Historic Places. Now, this place has such a long, long history. Right. I mean, fort, fort Reno has had its share, and it's also had its share of murders, suicides, all kinds of death. Yeah. The officer's quarters, which was built in 1936, is the visitor senator. Center. See, now you're Gosh. focusing on, like, don't mess up, don't mess up. and hey, I know, I know. At least you're not trying fault. to give out free emus like I did last week on that's after, or last time on last week. So. Well, it said that a lieutenant colonel killed himself in an upstairs bathroom in the 1940s, and his spirit haunts the building. Uh, a Chinese, it, they never did give that lieutenant colonel's name either. Uh, a Chinese worker and a female loan shark were both killed at the fort. The worker is buried in the cemetery. Now, there are 62 German and 8 Italian POWs buried in that cemetery. And the most famous POW is Johannes Kuntz. He was beaten to death by his fellow POWs because they thought he was a traitor and a snitch. Well, um... The visitors, uh, the hauntings are uh, like the visitor center, the apparition of a man in a U.S. uniform, uh, footsteps, voices, cold spots, the smell of cigar smoke. Uh, the staff claim that they heard their names being called when no one else was in there, doors opening and closing, things being moved. Uh, out on the grounds, you hear uh, disembodied voices, various apparitions. Yeah. Uh, strange wow. Im images. Um, when people would take photographs, mm -hmm. they would end up with these strange Im images on their photos, and they would be anywhere, you know, beside, uh, from orbs to people in different uniforms. Yeah, I'm sure. And even and even uh, figures of Native Americans. See, I would be kind um, of. But if you're a POW and you're not from this country and you're basically buried here, I mean, that could cause unrestfulness. Well, right. And the POWs that were buried in the cemetery, uh, about every year or so, a group from uh, Germany and Italy come and have some sort of ceremony in oh, the cemetery. That's good. Um, let's see. Uh, you also hear the sounds of marching and of horses. Uh, in the cemetery, there are various apparitions of men in different uniforms from the 1800s, uh, military to foreign uniforms, Amer mm -hmm. U.S. military to foreign uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, Native Americans, uh, settler, you know, people who Just appear to be pioneers. Just a wide variety of type of... Just a wide variety, mm -hmm. exactly. And um, in the buildings... 
uh, that you are allowed to go in. People have reported hearing disembodied voices, cold spots, right. sounds of conversations, uh, being touched. Yeah, and this place is and, really active. Yeah, I know. Uh, this place really has a lot of activity. And they even uh, uh, have ghost tours. So, And we will post the link to the site. And so, you know, if you're in the area, want to go on one of their ghost tours or whatever, the, the, their website will give you the information that you need and the, um, the schedule of the 2018 um, tour stuff ghost tours. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, this is definitely, if you're in the area, go check it out because it sounds like there's a I lot know, of residual I, and intelligent haunting supposedly occurring here. Right. And plus the history you can learn from it, you know, just of it. But and and the the thing of it is, this is another one of those that has a long, long, long history. You know I mean, I there were a crazy. lot of things in there, and I hate paraphrasing on a subject that I find really interesting. But you know, well, we always end up having our to do time. That. We yeah. have to, yeah. And so we don't get everything in. But we try to in to our, give a, in our a good summarization of it, and, and yeah, we try and to we do, do the best we can, but. We do give them links, right. though, to go continue on. It, exactly. So they can, you know, if they're interested enough, you know, really interested enough, they can go in there and read for themselves. And then yeah. they can, you know, find out the stuff that we had to leave out. Because we do leave out a lot of things. Mm. But, you know, what kind of creeps me out when it comes to people talking about having encounters or uh, from just residual or intelligent or whatever is the animal ones. You know, when people are seeing mm -hmm. apparitions of somebody riding a horse or you see a, a, uh, a dog or you know I don't know the animal one just kind of creeps me out a little bit you know because it's just well weird. there have been there have been reports too of apparitions of dogs or hearing dog barking well not just voices you know, dogs I'm talking barking about and there's no dogs there the body of because we have done a show I don't know what was it brass we did a show on we did a show on castles one time and yeah, one of the hauntings on one castle. of these castles was was every night. night this guy would be riding on his horse. Yeah, that was one of the nights because he accidentally killed the woman that he was in love with because she came out protecting her castle and he ended right. up killing her. But yeah, there's a couple different shows that we have had interesting stories where people were seeing like carriages and horses and lots right. of stuff. But that would be considered, I would think that would be like an imprint of time. You know, coming, and, and this is just us theorizing or our opinions or our thoughts or other people's thoughts. We can't ever say that this is fact, drink the Kool-Aid. We're never really trying to push that. We're just presenting right. different thoughts and opinions like we all do on the Internet. But I think I would even check this place out. There's just a lot of places. I mean, Oklahoma is just an interesting place, and it's somewhere I want to hit up. But um, I'm going to go and do this. I wouldn't, mind, ta I wouldn't take, mind taking a month and just going to Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, I've been through it several times, but I've never really been stopped. Been able to stop, it. yeah. Yeah, I've never stopped and, and, and checked anything out. Okay, I'm going to hit up our last one so we don't keep people too long. But um, another thing I found interesting was the the natural mound for formations that are found in Oklahoma. You know, and there, a lot of them are located in the Cato County and you have Rock Mary, Ghost Mound, and, you know, that, and there's just several other ones that I was kind of reading on. But, you know, people were um, uh, mentioning these on different websites where they said that there was some kind of paranormal activity occurring in some of these locations, which I do think it's interesting where there are certain um, nature spots that seem to attract something but anyway ghost mound is in the northwest part of cato county it's near county road 1110 and it was said to have gotten its name around the 1860s uh basically um when you go ahead and climb up this thing uh what you would see is there's tons of these carved names in this rock that dates back as far as 1911 and um, Rock Mary was named in 1849 after Mary Conway, which was a niece of James Conway, the governor of Arkansas. And it was like on May 23rd when uh, these two guys, Lieutenant Simpson and Harrison, they kind of climbed the rock and they put the flag on the crest and they kind of made it as a landmark that many used to uh, guide their way west to the, on the California Trail. 
you know, because back then everybody was traversing, grabbing up land and all this stuff. But um, I think that both of these are both on private property. But if you do contact the Hinton Historical Museum, they might be able to get you guys permission to go ahead and visit for Mary Rock. But people over, you know, the years have claimed to have had some strange orb or experiences, excuse me, but they've seen like these weird strange orbs of light at nighttime that seem to hang out around these formations. And there's also a story that's talked about like this headless female apparition that's been seen a lot on one of the two. And I think H.P. Lovecraft wrote a book about, uh, was inspired from one of these mounds and wrote one of, one of his short stories, but I don't know if it was ever really published big, huge, or whatever, but I was reading something about that too. But uh, a lot of people are talking about some of how these mounds in Cato County seem to have or attract some type of interesting, unusual activity when it comes to unexplainable things. And definitely weird lights, for sure. You know? So mm -hmm. I thought these were interesting and worth talking about, because sometimes you're driving down the road and you can just see them. You know, so it's not so much you're always going on the person's property, but you can be right off on the road. So that's okay. But, yeah, you can park on the road and watch them, I guess. But the one thing I do find fascinating is when you're going to these um, forests, because we did haunted forests, remember? We did places, uh, yeah. some cemeteries and stuff, where people are always seeing these strange glowing energy orbs. And that's something that always fascinates me, because it doesn't always have to pertain to, like, oh, it's a ghost but it always makes me wonder, like, well, what's creating or causing it? So yeah. that would make me, you know, come out here to see it. But also there's been legends and stories of um, there's these hieroglyphic type of things written on some of these mounds that will, if you figure it out, it leads you to treasure, gold, or whatever. But, I mean, I can't confirm that. But the, it's Well, some people about. believe it, though. Yeah, well, because um, all these people are traveling across the Americas, they hit this, and they're like, oh, let's bury some of our gold here that we jacked from other people. Because we did shows on, what was that, the Bloody Benders, and mm -hmm. those two brothers, what was those two brothers' name? Uh, basically, during this time period, they were, you know, killing and robbing all these people, and then they were hiding gold and money and all this stuff in certain areas and stuff, right. too. So you never know if there might be a little truth to some of this. Oh, well, but Rock Mary talking... got her name. Someone's asking how Rock Mary got her name. She got her name because it was named after these two lieutenants um, who climbed the rock. In, and there's actually a pla uh, plaque that states, you know, uh, May 23rd of 1849, these two guys climbed this rock and named it after Mary Conway, who was the niece of James Conway, the governor of Arkansas. So, But there's, there is some little plaques that talk about the history of these people using these markers or landmarks to find their way to california you know yeah well that's what they did you know they went by landmarks back then but you were talking about those lights you know not necessarily being paranormal you know like in marfa texas they have the marfa lights and people go out there and watch them and nobody knows what causes them what where they come from you know i mean i don't think they're paranormal but i i agree with you you know just because you see lights and stuff doesn't necessarily mean paranormal. There could be another yeah, something natural explanation for knows. them. It could be a, nat a natural occurrence. Right, or some will say, like, well, some talk about, which we have to do a show on because it was another viewer's request. We were supposed to talk about crop circles. And right. some, we have to do some alien stuff because we have, we have, like, a list of all the stuff that people want us to do. And we do want to do And we're them. trying to go down it. Yeah, we want to do them. And sometimes we jump around the list, so it's not in order of how we got it. And, you know, we, we we totally thank you guys all the time for, you know, suggesting this stuff because it brings us to some stuff we never even knew about. And it's very fascinating. But when they talk about seeing these crop circles, people claim they've seen these energy orb lights, too, going around in the field. And the next thing you know, you have this thing out there, you know. So, but, you know, the Native Americans always talked about when you're around these natural formations and stuff, they talk about nature spirits and the windigos right. and, and sure um, all these other stuff so you know what i would love to see paranormal groups of native americans on tv all native americans going to their places and sharing their histories and sharing their experiences you know we have like ghost adventures and we have things like that or whatever but i would love to see other people and you know i think it'd be amazing to get to see 
uh, some of these different Native American tribes have their own show and, and, and we can learn from them and learn their spiritual belief systems and, and some of their stories and, and right. see some of their places. <clears throat> I think it would be like interesting that. to watch that. Oh, I totally would. You know, I would think that would yeah. be amazing. But why don't you uh, kind of let everybody know what we're <coughs> going to be doing the next show? Okay, I want to thank all of our mods, and I hope I get them all down. Uh, Richard, Kathy, Alex, Studio Doppel, 54, yeah. Studio 54. Or, no, wait, not Studio 54. <laughs> Sorry. I, Studio Radio. I'm thinking of the Studio stupid. Reband. <laughs> yeah, or something. Studio Reband. Sorry. I'm kidding out. I want to thank all of you for doing a good job tonight. I want to thank Raven for a good show. And for everybody that came in to chat and who are listening to us, join us April uh, Tuesday, April 17th at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific for a two-hour show. Come chat and listen when we discuss another viewer's request. And we're working on this. We just decided on this today. We're going to do haunted asylums in Canada. Yeah, there, This well, is a viewer's request. Yep. This woman has asked us more than once to do it, and we're going to do it on our next show. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Please subscribe to us. Give us a like, and please share us with others on any social media site you may be a part of. Right. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, if you want to get show reminders, you can either click on our name here on YouTube and, and um, subscribe, or you can go to our website, Anything But Ordinary 2, the number 2, wix.com slash anything but ordinary, and you can sign up for weekly emails, reminders for our live shows on YouTube. Or if you like, you can contact us there with show ideas or friendly banter or even share some of your own experiences with us. Um, I hope everybody has... A great week, and thank you for hanging out with us, and we'll see you at our next show. Good night. Good night, everyone.